Welcome, foolish mortals, to Disney Coast to Coast. I'm here to introduce your host, your Disney Coast to Coast host. <laughs> Kindly raise your volume, please. Jeff has plenty of Disney chatter for everyone. There's no turning back now. <laughs> hey folks and welcome to Disney Coast to Coast, the ultimate unofficial Disney fan podcast. I'm Jeff DePauly, and today on the show I'm having a chat with the makeup effects master, Tony Gardner. Considering it's the spooky season and just days until Halloween, I originally intended to speak with Tony about his work solely on the extraterrestrial alien encounter as well as Hocus Pocus, but as we got into conversation, I discovered a bunch of other Disney projects that Tony worked on. Now, I've known Tony for a while, so I was quite shocked by the amount of new information I was discovering. On top of that, you may recall that on last week's episode, I mentioned someone who actually created the famous ghost face mask from Scream. Well, the guy I was referring to was Tony, and he sets the story straight in this episode. It's all coming your way right after this. For a long time, we've been hearing rumors about a Hocus Pocus movie sequel. But did you know that the iconic Halloween story already has a book sequel? And better yet, you can get the audiobook for free over at audibletrial.com slash DCTC. Just head to audibletrial.com slash DCTC and search for Hocus Pocus and the all-new sequel. Then turn off the lights, light a candle, get cozy, and listen to both the original tale and its sequel. Once again, the site is audibletrial.com slash DCTC. That's A-U-D-I-B-L-E-T-R-I-A-L dot com slash DCTC. Prepare for some insight. You've tuned in to an exclusive DCTC interview. Hello, Tony, and welcome to Disney Coast to Coast. Thanks for coming on today. Thank you for having me, Jeff. Yes, you are a master makeup man, animatronics man, mostly makeup. And you have a tie, I mean, Hocus Pocus, I would say most famously. But one of the things that I've actually never even heard you talk about, which is why you're here today, is to talk about the extraterrestrial alien encounter. Gosh, how long ago was it at this point? That was 1995 that that opened. Was it really? 1995 oh it opened. So you probably worked on it in 94 mm. would be my guess. Yeah, yeah. So it was like, was it like right after Hocus Pocus? It was because it, it was funny because we worked with Kathy Najimy on set with Hocus Pocus. You know, we didn't have anything to do with her. And then alien, extraterrestrial alien encounter comes along and we're life casting her and painting her green and gluing foam to her head and she was great. She was awesome. It was just really cool to go from one show to another and have, you know, the same person there. Did she like remember you? Like you said, it sounds like you had very little to do with her during Hocus Pocus. Yeah. Cause I was, I was more with the cat and with Billy Butcherson mm -hmm. and Bette Midler has a lot of interaction with Billy, but we kind of watched Sarah and, and um, Kathy from a distance. More than talk to them, yeah. Now, did you ever actually experience the extraterrestrial alien encounter? No, that's my one regret, to be honest, is it never made it out to California, mm -hmm. and I never made it out to Florida, so... I Have you it. never been to Walt Disney World? I've been when I, okay. I was little. I mean, we okay. grew up in Ohio, and we'd go every couple of years, but once I came out to California and, and started working... I, I don't know that I've been there since. We got to get you there, man. Let's get you I there. I need to go. Not right now, though. <laughs> but, yeah. uh, but, you know, the extraterrestrial alien encounter is an interesting attraction because its history is pretty interesting because people have yeah. very varied opinions on it. Some people mm -hmm. 
loved it. Some people say it was the scariest attraction ever in a Disney park. And I kind of honestly, I'm in the camp of, I thought it was a kind of lame attraction. <laughs> it's So much of it takes place in the dark. I think the story was fun and the work you did on it was great and stuff. But so much of it is just sitting in a dark theater with, uh, you know, sound around you and, you know, air blasts and water drips and stuff. Uh, it's kind of like one of those 1950s movies where you're kind of, yes. shot, you know, they blow air on your feet or, or whatever. You ever see that movie Matinee with John Goodman? No, but it sounds like the same thing. Dude, you've never seen Matinee? No, I just don't get out much, I guess. Tony, promise me you will like rent it or something. Is it good? You'll love it. I love oh. it. I think it's a fun little kitschy movie and yeah, it's so much fun. And, it's yeah, John you'll, Goodman. Like, Right. John Goodman it plays like kind of like an Alfred Hitchcock type of character. And he's invented this whole movie process of exactly what you're talking about. Blasting the air, buzzing the seats, all that stuff. Oh, you got to oh, see it. It's so much fun. That's cool. Yeah. So this attraction did officially open at Magic Kingdom in 1995 in Tomorrowland. One of the things that a lot of people say is that perhaps it just wasn't the right home for it to be in the um, Magic Kingdom. It's a very, admittedly, it's strange, but I thought they did a great job uh, working in the story because the story was that this company called XS Tech, XS-TECK, uh, they were showcasing a new technology, and that's fitting for Tomorrowland's storyline, I think. And the technology, you know, of course, was transporting aliens and life forms and stuff like that. And these characters, you primarily worked on like the videos that we saw. Right. And right. where was this stuff shot? Uh, we shot it all in Los Angeles. It was pretty much just the four actors, you know, um, they're all on monitors in the, in the ride. We had very little idea of, of what the sets and everything would look like uh, ahead of time, the, the whole technology aspect of it and their branding and their logo and all that was still being worked out. But I, I thought it was kind of brilliant. The company's name being the initials X and S. Yeah. It seemed so perfectly corporate. It was, it was beautiful. <laughs> and then we started seeing more and more stuff come together. And then uh, the costume designer was hired to come up with the military look for Jeffrey Jones, as well as the pretty look for the spokesmodel, who was Tyra Banks. And then all of a sudden there was a sort of like flood of information and we got to see a lot more what the, the ride was all about. And I was actually really surprised that it was a, a Disney ride, um, even more so after finding out how it had started. As Alien, right? Yeah, which is completely mind blowing that you would take like the worst, scariest haunted house in space movie <laughs> yeah. and plant it in the middle of a Disney theme park where little kids are running around, you know, I mean, it was literally that the actual alien that shoots out the teeth that, you know, bites the brain out of your skull while you're standing there yeah. and invading the theater that you're, you're literally locked into and can't get out of. So that was the original concept that, you know, the famous movie alien, and it was going to be that alien. And yeah. Eventually, George Lucas got involved, and so did right. you work – that That was one thing that surprised me is since George Lucas was involved, and obviously he's had a lot of experience creating aliens and doing makeup on them and stuff, I'm surprised he didn't just bring in his people, but I, I guess how did you get involved? That's a really good question. <laughs> you don't know, do you? You don't remember. No, I, I just remember having meetings with, with the director who had this – he, was, he had shot a couple of the uh, sort of attractions. He, he directed Brave Little Toaster for, oh, cool. for Disney. And it's Jerry, his name is Jerry Reese. And he had gone on to shoot like segments and stuff for different theme park rides where they needed like an on-screen element or something like that. Super talented guy, really great visual style, very easy to talk to. But we talked to him and work with him on maybe five or six things for Disney. This was just one of them. What were the others? Uh, one of them was an Epcot ride with Eric Idle as the face of the moon. I think it's you did the journey into the imagination moon face. Yeah. Yeah. Are you kidding? <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, there's it's this Tony this weird stuff. Tony, wait a second. You like that's another thing that people have such crazy opinions on. That that actual face, ride. Eric, Oh, well, first of all, that ride, the original ride, was super iconic. Then they completely redid it, and people hated it with the you yeah. know the Eric Idle thing. And then they changed it and updated it a bit, and it's it's less abrasive for some people. I actually think it's fine. It's nowhere near as good as the original was. But the fact that you did the moon face makeup, like, I have a friend who is terrified of that thing. I'm going to have to let him know. Really? Yeah. Wow, so we do all the scary stuff for Disney, apparently. Apparently. Wow, so you, wow, that's, I had no idea. Okay, so Moonface, Eric Idle, and Journey into yeah. Imagination. What was some of the others? Uh, did some legs for Martin Short. He's sitting on a ball. He grabs his feet and he pulls his legs up to his head. He's like doing, he's like a contortionist kind of character. Not sure what that would have been. That sounds like something Epcot, something. Yeah, I believe that was Epcot as well. There was a ride that existed briefly, super briefly. Superstar Limo. Yes. You did Superstar Limo? Oh yeah. my gosh. What did you do on that? I worked on all the stuff that's gone away. <laughs> a couple of things. There, jo there was a Joan Rivers puppet. Yeah. Like an, an animatronic that greets you and, and slanders people and talks kind of crazy as you go in. Then there's a Melissa Joan Hart a uh, head floating in a ball. Okay. And we did that. And then we did this, this like sort of slimy agent guy. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think that was it for that ride. Wow. But there were, you know, animatronic related things basically. Okay. Um, so, so we were considered Imagineers, you know, and I had worked at Rick's on, uh, Rick Baker's on Captain EO. Oh my God, Tony, you're blowing my mind right now. All right, this was supposed to be mostly about Alien Encounter, but please yeah. keep going because this is blowing my mind. But on that one, I, I had very little to do on it. Um, but it was interesting because, oh, and I did um, the dog for Honey, I Shrunk the Audience. Shut, shut <laughs> up. Wait a sec, look at the shirt that I'm wearing right now. Read it to everybody. Uh, Read what it says. Warning, may suddenly start talking about Rick Moranis. Yes, that is awesome. I'm the biggest Honey I Shrunk the Kids fan like ever. Seriously. Well, okay, yes. so the ride. I love that 4D attraction. It was one of my favorites. I'm still heartbroken that it's gone. Yeah, and Captain Eo had been there prior to. Yeah, yeah. And I had worked on that over at Rick Baker's, and they had footage outside that theater of us in the shop, and it called us the Imagineer, Disney Imagineers at work, and it was just the different shops that worked on different aspects of the movie. But for that brief period of time where we were working for Disney, they called us Imagineers, which to me was the coolest thing ever. And then to go work on Honey, I Shrunk the Audience. And all we did was the dog that comes out at the end. And um, sneezes on the audience. And sneezes on the audience, yeah. And it was, it was done oversized with a big curtain um, so they could get more control of the thing. The head was probably... I don't know, maybe like 15 inches long. The whole thing was oversized so you could do it as a hand puppet because the real dog was such a tiny little terrier. So we could get more animatronics into the head and make it do more. And we were all super excited because we got all this really cool subtle stuff around the eyes. And then last minute they're like, you know what? Let's put 3D glasses on the dog since it's a 3D ride. Oh, man. <laughs> for a split second we're like, well, there won't be any 3D glasses scaled up to fit the dog, so maybe this won't happen. And then they asked us to make the glasses, so we sort of sealed our own doom and made these glasses and stuck them on the puppet. And it's like, it probably could have been a sock puppet at this point, because the glasses pretty much covered up everything. But it was still fun to do, you know? Well, I'll tell you that I... You know, I experienced Honey, I Shrunk the Audience a couple billion times, and... Really? Oh, yeah. I never noticed that that dog was a puppet at the end i really? never would have thought that so well, it it's work. a puppet at the end do you still have that puppet no no they kept it oh, they kept it i man. think randall kleiser the director wanted it and i believe it went into disney archives and it was foam latex so it would be a rotten 
zombie dog <laughs> deteriorated by now <laughs> yeah exactly my mind is blown uh, tony how many years have we known each other and i'm just discovering this about you i i can't even this is killing me as you can see i really like to talk about myself <laughs> Well, you know, I mean, I obviously researched you to prepare for this, and none of this, none of these projects came up. In fact, well, I was he's pretty keen on you not really promoting them. You well, know? just come on a podcast and talk about it whenever you want. It's fine. Uh, apparently, so I think I learned that today. So yeah. So wait a sec. So That's we got good. so we got Journey into Imagination, Honey, I Shrunk the Audience, Captain EO, and mm. who, you said you were working with Rick Baker on Captain EO. Yeah, I ran like the – he did the little fuzz bucket, the little furry guy. That oh, yeah, yeah. Around. A guy named Tom Hester sculpted it, and a couple of us made molds, and then I ran the foam skins. Someone else did the mechanics. And I think it went all the way back to Tom Hester to um, paint it once it had been furred. Um, and then I believe he went on set and puppeteered with it. Wow. But that was fun because prior to that, we had done Thriller over at Rick Baker's with – Michael Jackson. So I was like, okay, there's a cool overlap. Yeah. You know? So you are a zombie in Thriller. Yeah. I'm the first one that comes out of the ground when they go by the um, cemetery. Tony, do you know how cool that is? That just means I'm old. It means they're going to look like, <laughs> look like a zombie pretty soon. I think. <laughs> oh, no. I, that's really, I mean, that's incredible. Wow. Well, okay. I was 18 and it was my first real job. And I thought that. Every movie operated the way John Landis did. I mean, it was such a family environment and so warm. And he knew I was interested in filmmaking. And he would explain stuff to me. He invited me to come out and watch George Folsey edit. And he he was editing the behind the scenes stuff for the, the VHS, you know, behind the scenes thing. And um, he's like, this is that scene where you guys did the bladder and it pops. He's like, but you can't hear it on screen. So nobody knows what you're all reacting to. So we took the sound of a birthday balloon popping and we, you know, shrank that noise down really small. We threw that in there. So there was some sort of audio cue for the audience to be able to follow what's going on and help us tell our story. And I was like, oh my God, this is brilliant. And I think I spent like a day watching them do all that stuff. But I was literally 18 off the boat from Ohio. I dropped out of school at USC to do the job at Rick's. He offered me four months worth of work. He, and he knew I was all over the place. He's like, you like music, you like filmmaking, you like makeup effects. Maybe after four weeks of this, you'll know whether you want to do this or not, at least. And maybe it'll help you pick a direction. And I ended up working for him for four years. And uh, it was literally, obviously, the best training you could ask for, you know? And wow. it was all like on the job, hands on kind of stuff which was great. But on certain shows, we'd all have different things to do. And like Thriller, I started, I was literally the guy that took out the trash and emptied the trash cans and picked up food and supplies. I was the runner. And that's what I was hired as. And as things went on and more work needed to be done and the deadline was still tight, I started doing more stuff and actually hired someone else to become the runner I came onto the crew. I did all, all the background zombies. I was cutting, I was running like incredible melting man mask molds and zombies and different molds from different shows and cutting and, and like gluing all these pieces together to turn these like six zombies into 24, basically. Wow. And um, I had a blast and I did the bladders for the werewolf transformation. I got to build a zombie on myself. And I got to be in it. I got to be on set every day for five days. And, and I was hooked. That was what put me where I am today. After that experience, I was like, I don't need to go back to school. I can always go back to school. But these opportunities only come around you know, every so often. And, and let's ride this ride because I really enjoyed, I got to experience the whole thing from pre-production through filming through post-production. And I, I loved every bit of it. And I always thought that if I could just be involved in filmmaking in any capacity, even if it's making uh, rubber legs for Martin Short, <laughs> I would love to do it. And, and I just keep doing it. That's you know? amazing. And we should say, you're, 
extremely successful. You've had you've started your own company, uh, Alterion Incorporated, right? Yeah, yeah, we yeah. started that. Um, I did the blob in '88, and then had a little detour for your partnering with somebody that I shouldn't have. And then I started. My wife and I actually started it right after that. So it's it's been around, boy, since '90, '90, '91. I think we incorporated in '91. Wow. Yeah. Unbelievable. Yeah. Okay, before we get back to extraterrestrial, was there any other <laughs> Disney projects you wanted to add? We got Journey into Imagination, Martin Short's Legs, Honey, I Shrunk the Audience, Captain EO. Those are all the theme park ones. The okay. film ones are like Hocus Pocus. Or, yeah, of course. Yeah, cool. that stuff. Okay, so let's talk about, you know, the makeup that you did for extraterrestrial because, as you mentioned, you had some pretty crazy people and actually uh, we were talking about the whole lucasfilm george lucas thing did right. you work with him on this at all was he hands-on in that way or did you have zero no, communication he, his, his involvement was more with jerry reese uh, okay. prior, prior to us getting involved okay and and i guess he had made it more family friendly and sort of tweaked the storyline a bit i mean if you take out the giant killing alien in the tube sure it's actually a very family friendly sort of fun like hey we're going to make this work and we're going to send this to the to this place and we're going to bring something else back and it was a very cohesive linear story that was like fun for kids i mean almost like a you know star tours adventure sort of thing i mean that's essentially what they did when they brought stitch in yeah it. yeah right that's what i heard yeah but it's like, okay, let's take that and this matter transporter idea and let's fuse this with a giant killing alien that's going to escape and terrorize the audience and try and kill them. And hey, while we're at it, let's show a guy dying up in the rafters <laughs> while all this is going on. Pretty mind-blowing of a concept as far as anything you'd ever imagine coming out of a Disney theme park, I would say. Yeah. You know? It's it's a bit of a strange choice for sure, and that's part of the reason why you know it didn't live that long. It lived until what was it, two thousand and three, I think. Yeah, two thousand three yeah. is uh, is when it closed. So you did work on Tyra Banks. You did make up for her. Any right. fun stories about? I mean, you know, you work really closely with these people because you're getting molds of their faces and stuff like that. Yeah, we had to mold their heads and. They had these weird horns that grew out of like their their collarbone areas. Mm. Um, so we we're doing these substantial head casts of them. We did Kevin Pollack, Tyra Banks, Kathy Najimi, and Jeffrey Jones. And then we had to design these these alien makeups that didn't alter their faces too much, so that they were still somewhat recognizable. But at the same time, we were kind of eliminating their eyebrows, anything that made them human, and trying to sort of play with the idea of beauty in the case of Tyra Banks's character. And then um, how do you make a, a guy with no eyebrows look, look mean to be Jeffrey Jones? So it was all of a sudden, we had all these nice neutral head casts of them, and then we had to sort of imbue them with the character and the essence of, uh, of who their character was and figure out the layers that worked and also try and differentiate masculine versus feminine. Uh, it, it was really interesting and it was really challenging. And I, I feel really fortunate that all the actors that they cast had really strong personalities and a sense of acting that we were all sort of already aware of, except for Tyra, really. And she came in as a 19-year-old up-and-coming model who'd never done anything before, let alone get her full head cast. I was going to say that. like, So in her case, it was a good chance it was the first time she's ever done a head cast or anything like that. Yeah. Have you yeah. ever, whether this project or another, have you ever been in a situation where like the actor just couldn't handle that? Because it is not a simple process. In fact, I at your studio, I remember seeing all of the face casts that you have. You have this really fun setup along the wall of all these face casts of celebrities. And it's kind of like a guessing game because it's hard to pick pe you know, yeah. some people out without yeah. their hair and everything. But have you ever had 
a celebrity that's like cast in a movie and they're just like, you know, I'm having a hard time handling this. Oh yeah. Yeah, for sure. What do you do? Sometimes you can help sort of talk them through and guide them through. Like we worked with somebody who was very claustrophobic. We did one head cast that was just the face, just really small. And then we covered the ears and talked to him the whole way through it and said, and when it came off, I'm like, okay, look, you have a smile on your face in this life cast. Obviously you were doing fine talking to us and listening with us and, and you felt comfortable with us. He'd had a bad experience with somebody else prior. Uh, I said, how about let's try and do a full head now. And if for any reason you, you change your mind while we're doing it, just give us a thumbs down and we'll immediately take it all off. So he knew he had an out and the head cast came out great. It, it's wonderful. We've, we've also had people though that have been so scared to do it that one person took two Xanax, <laughs> to, a muscle relaxant to help them come down because they were a very intense human being to begin with. And oh my God, literally like falling asleep, so comfortable and so relaxed. We had to like wait a bit so that he was okay for us to be able to do our job. Um, That's so funny. <laughs> but it's, it's funny because it's different with different people. We did Vanessa Williams for a movie that's coming out soon. And she's stunningly beautiful. And, and you know, she's been Miss America and, and a dancer and a singer. And it's been all about this, you know, this aesthetic. And we're like, okay, we're going to put you in a bald cap and stick this ball in your mouth because you're fake head is supposed to be screaming and we're going to take off all your makeup so that we can not have it come off in the life cast mold. Super cool. Quite the trooper did the whole thing, smiled going in and was smiling coming out. And we're just like, this is like the ideal. This is what you want to see everybody do. And most of the time people do fine and, and they, they treat it almost like a meditation exercise. And some people don't even want to come out. They're like, Oh, I was in this really cool place and I didn't really want to come out. It was like I could hear my heartbeat and my breathing and my pulse in my ear. And some people like that and other people go, oh, my God, I could hear my heartbeat. and Get me out of this thing. So everybody, it's just, you know, everyone's different. I got to admit, I think I would have difficulty with it. I... I would have to get in a mental space. Like I'd have to work on yeah. that to get there. I think it's a trust issue too. You really have to trust the people doing it. But but I think you have to find a happy place and go. From my personal experience, it's like, all right, I, I know I need to like tune out somewhere happy for like 40 minutes tops and just not think and worry about what's happening to me. And I remember like, like 15, 20 minutes in when all the bandages were done and it was, we were waiting for it to set up. I was like, what if an actor freaked out in this and, and tried to get out? So I thought, I'll just try and move my head. But you, there's like no space. Oh, now you're making me anything. panic. <laughs> it's, like, it's like you've been, you've had all this stuff poured around your body and you can't move oh. a millimeter. You could pull your lips in, pull away from it, and that was it. And I was like, oh my God, if I was claustrophobic, I would be on the floor right now. That's the thing. I I, I get I'm, it. Yeah. I'm I selectively it. claustrophobic. It's very weird. In some cases that are claustrophobic situations, I'm perfectly fine. And then in others, I'll like start to have like a panic attack. And I, I just have to like calm myself down. And even in situations that I've been in before, sometimes on rides, I've like a lap bar uh, will freak Yeah, me I wanted out. to ask you, yeah. It's like, okay, extraterrestrial alien encounter. Did you go? That one didn't bother me so much. That was just a shoulder restraint. It wasn't that big of a deal. But like, I don't know if you've ever ridden, uh, you know, Harry Potter and the Forbidden Journey. At, yeah, but isn't that the same sort of shoulder restraint? It is, but it, this wasn't a shoulder restraint. The only purpose of those shoulder pieces on extraterrestrial was you could feel them resting on your shoulders and they just uh -huh. wanted the ability to make them go up and down to make it feel like the creature was like on top of you that uh, was the only purpose it's not like it was really holding you in place or anything right. so that didn't bother me but like i don't know uh, it's very selective and weird for me and, and it's yeah. not a character trait i love about myself but i think uh, you know i trust you but 
I think I would still have a hard time getting yeah. a mold of yeah, my yeah. face. It's it's an odd thing. I mean the the what was the ride? I think it was Screaming uh, at Disney's California Adventure. Yeah, California Screaming. The bar comes down over your head. Yeah, and it not only comes down and you see levels of it past your field of vision, and then it holds you down tight. There's this loud ratcheting noise yeah. while it's coming down and you know it's locking to hold you in. And I maybe I'm one of those people that just always wants to know there's a way out. Oh, so that bothers you. That bothers me. That's why I was asking you about that. That doesn't bother me at all. Like really? in that in that situation. Because uh, interestingly enough, on roller coasters, I prefer shoulder restraints because really? it makes me feel secure inside the vehicle. Yeah, okay, I can see that. Yeah. Yeah, I thought with extraterrestrial, the idea was to make people feel like they couldn't get out. That they were no, trapped. it was to play with the pressure on their shoulders. Okay. Uh, at least that's the way. I, I think the excuse was, you know, it's it was needed for the experiment and stuff, but it was really just so they could play with pressure on your shoulders, I believe. So, Got but it. but on this on this attraction. Were there any of the actors that you had? By the way, we should mention, you know, everybody knows Tyra Banks. If you're hearing the name Jeffrey Jones and can't put a face to the name, he's Mr. Rooney in Ferris Bueller's Day Off, and he's the dad in Beetlejuice. Kathy and Jimmy, of course, everybody knows from Hocus Pocus. And Kevin Pollock, you've seen in everything. The Usual Suspects is a really big one for him, and I always think of House Arrest, but he's done a billion things. He's amazing in, in Usual Suspects. I mean, he's such a talented and funny guy. We were always afraid he was going to, we used to call it joke the makeup off because he just had all this banter. We're like, oh my God, he's going to wear the makeup off. <laughs> but we even cheat. And uh, he was great. He was super cool. Did any of them have difficulty though with the face casts and everything? No, I, I think most of them kind of, we kind of presented it as a sort of cool experience and you know, short term. And if they had problems with anything, we would just do partial. And back then there was no silicone. It was all alginate as the, as the mold making material and it's algae and aloe and kelp and, and it's all organic and it was being used for facial masks like in salons in Beverly Hills. So we'd be like, all right, we're going to do a, a full head facial mask on you. And they're paying you to do this instead of you paying us to do it. <laughs> and you'll be out of it in 15 minutes. And if there's any problems with it, we can clean you up and do it over, but it, it cleans out your pores and it's good for your skin. And I think the fact too, that we had other life casts of other people helped people feel comfortable, you know, yeah. and we, we've kept some over time. It wasn't as good way back then. Like one of the life casts you saw when you came was Eric Idle's head from Epcot. From the moon. Yeah. 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 Um, but a lot of the other ones have over over time have sort of disappeared in the various moves. And I remember John Travolta from your work on Hairspray. I yeah. remember uh, Doug Jones from you know Hocus Pocus was a one yeah. I remember. Yeah, you you have a lot of great faces hanging on your wall. It's very very cool. It's and funny because we we still have Doug's full head cast wow. um, from Hocus Pocus. Very little has survived from that film. Um, we have his wig and um, we had his whole head cast and we just had to do a makeup on him recently. And we pulled that out and we compared it to a head cast somebody had done of him about a year ago. Mm. And we realized it didn't really matter which one we used because <laughs> he has not changed like at all. That's so funny. Yeah. Too funny. Now, when they did, uh, they basically re reworked this attraction when they realized it was too scary for the parks and stuff. Did you have to go back and redo anything or was your job done? No, our, our job was done at that point. We had heard that they might possibly pitch all of our stuff to the curb and, and go with a completely different approach. Wow. But I'm sure that it, felt great, huh? <laughs> yeah, but I mean, listen to my track record with the rides that I've done. Right. Listen, yeah. Eric Idle's moon face is still swinging there to this very day. So, is it? oh yeah, I gotta go because it's the only one that's still up. It's still up, and honestly, you should go because there's always rumors about that getting reworked. Although right now, with theme park budgets like on a halt, you probably oh, right. still got a while. But yeah, he's still there, man. Uh, so that's so cool. Too that was funny. one of the few times. That was the, one of the few times where we were able to take photos on set 
mm-hmm. while we were filming. Like when we did Extraterrestrial, it was like high secrecy and oh okay, you know, and and there were different versions of things shot and different options, and they had actors all of whom could improv fantastically. So they had way more footage than they'd ever need. But it was cool because they had all these options. So we always felt that if they're going to rework it, maybe they'd go more for the humor and give these guys more screen time, literally. I mean, they're in the ride on screens talking to the audience from their alien planet. Tyra's in the opening when you're going through the lines and all that. And she's like the spokesmodel for excess technology. So her whole banter and everything else was pretty much sort of like set in stone and she followed a written script. But the other guys and Gal, all of them were just hilarious. I, I mean, really great. And, and Kathy Najimi is the one who had the idea for the eye piece that her character wears, which was totally like a last minute thing. She's like, hey, can you guys make this and, and bring it? It would be fun to play with it and, and do stuff. And we brought it and uh, the director loved it and, and let her character wear it. But she was always coming up with ideas for her character while we were doing it. And Jeffrey had ideas too in regards to coloring and the way that he wanted to like present the back of the head. You know, like he wanted to be like a really mean sort of Frankenstein face and then do a sharp turn and all of a sudden you see that his head's like, you know, 24 inches long and, and defo- you know, this weird football kind of thing. They were all really into the, the physical aspect of it. And it was really fun to watch them do their job. I hear that a lot where the actors have input on their look and stuff like that. And I'm curious, like, does that drive you crazy sometimes? Or are you really into that? Like, and at, one po- at what point are you like, no, this is set in stone. Like, you can't change this. And I guess, does it come down to the director as to whether or not they're allowed to play that much? I think it comes down to the stature that the actor has. Sure. Okay. In the community. And then the director's standing as to whether or not he feels input is worth it or not. um, And whether he agrees with it or not. And fortunately, most of the time an actor has a lot of input he and the director are usually very collaborative. So it it makes it pretty easy, but like we did hairspray for Disney and it was John Travolta as Edna Turnblad. Hairspray is not Disney. It's not. It's a new line cinema. Oh my gosh. Backtrack. (laughs) Adam Shankman's offices were at Disney. That's why I thought it was Disney. That may be true. Yeah. That wouldn't surprise me, but no, it's a new line cinema movie. Oh, funny. Because yeah. because my meetings were all on the lot at Disney, and I would always detour to go by the sound stages where we shot we shot Hocus Pocus. Oh, that's so funny! Just because it was such a cool memory, you know. But John Travolta definitely had ideas about his character, and I mean the the truth of the matter is, if you're a person, can wear three hundred pounds a lot of different ways. You know, you can you can Alfred Hitchcock it and have a lot of mass down here. There's just, you know, underneath your chin and your jawline and have all that filled in. And then there's other people where it's, it's more proportionate over the body. Uh, other people can be a little more bottom heavy. And, and we got actually live models to take pictures of, to show as examples on, uh, besides the pictures of Divine from the first film, we had sort of this book of photo reference of, of what Edna could look like. And John immediately like literally vetoed like every single one of those. He's like, I see her more voluptuous and I see her like she's, you know, she's a big woman, but she's kind of squeezed it into this dress and her, her chest is up and out. And he was referencing uh, a specific Italian actress uh, slash celebrity personality. And it, and he was very specific on the body, on the head, on the other hand, and the neck, we sculpted maybe six different versions of his head and he whittled it down to one. Adam Shankman whittled it down to two, one of which was the one John liked. And we tested it and we tested it in a trailer parked in John Travolta's driveway. (laughs) So obviously he had some input, Yeah, um, which was great because he, once it went on and he could see it in the mirror, we, we had different wigs and different things for him to play with different colors and different styles because you're trying to figure the character out. 
and it became very collaborative and and we followed his lead and we followed his lead uh, in regards to a neck thing and it was it was very collaborative and it was very fun but the short answer i guess is most of the time actors trust you and let you go but the larger status actors or the studios that hire the actor who says i just paid 8 million dollars for this person i want to see their face there's input there that you can't ignore mm-hmm. because when it comes down to it we're hired guns at the end of the day as well when they hired tyra to play the spokesmodel they wanted us to keep her 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 like natural beauty and we're like we're painting her green <laughs> and how do you do that and we're getting rid of her eyebrows so there was a lot of work done with the cheekbones and pulling extending the back of her head and putting sort of like a swoop into it and then we added like a neck brace neck ring kind of thing that supported the head but it also helped cut in a jawline and helped us shape the their faces a little bit more and then it really got into beauty makeup for Tyra around the eyes a clean a clean lip color and then do we put eyebrows on it was so easy with a green face to make somebody look like they were in drag like not innocent and and attractive in any any way as far as looking like a a young spokesmodel just because the skin tone color was was so extreme so with Kathy because her character was such a character we were we were doing character stuff we were doing sort of like really rounded eyebrows and stuff like that and when we were designing her character she was she had input and we trusted her and we went more with her ideas because she had way more experience than than all of us you know and and figuring out how to how to balance the humor in the face with still being a pleasant thing to look at and backing off on the frankenstein green and trying to lighten lighten her up and stuff like that jeffrey jones goes like full boris karloff with the the heavy brows same with kevin pollock really too and that the um the neck wrap that cuts in and gives them you know really pronounced cheekbones it was fun figuring the stuff out and they were all definitely collaborative though tyra was the quieter one of the whole group but i mean keep in mind she was 19 and she was she came to do her life cast with her mom oh wow that's so funny her mom, her mom drove her there that's you know so funny. we just worked on a thing for free form with Tyra it's a doll that comes to life oh life size or yeah we did life size too and we I was going to do... say what do you mean you just did it isn't that old but they no, no, the we did the one a couple of years ago but okay. it was funny cuz i hadn't seen her since she was 19 and now Does she, she remember you yeah yeah oh, that's and she's funny. like 40 and has a kid and we were we were talking about stuff way back when and and um uh, she was talking about her experience as a kid just starting to model and just starting to get out and do stuff and then being asked to do this thing that was so extremely different from everything that she'd done before she kind of just sort of trusted us and everybody else to kind of lead it and and guide it and you know she was great to work with they were all great well, it became an iconic attraction for a lot of people, even though it didn't last as long as the moon face at Epcot. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a shocker. <laughs> but I can't let you go without talking a little bit about Hocus Pocus here. Now, of course, your main character there was Billy Butcherson. And the thing that's so interesting about Billy is, you know, you're making this scary zombie character for a Disney movie. So how do you tiptoe around that line? That was the hardest part of the whole thing. You know, the fir- the very first meetings um where the character was described where they're saying we want to cut his fingers off, we want to stitch his mouth shut, we want to have his head knocked off, we want to have his headless body wandering around. And keep in mind this is a Disney movie, so make it family friendly. And those two that description didn't go with that title, you know, so it really came down to trying to figure out a color scheme that worked and then the idea that he's more dried out he's been buried for several hundred years so when his finger or head gets broken off it's going to be a clean break like a old stick and you're going to see some stuff inside but even that's going to be dry so it became <laughs> less less intimidating 
and less off-putting to, for people to see uh, as well. You still get the humor in those scenes as opposed to any sort of ew factor, I think. Yeah. Know? And a lot of that comes down to Doug, of course, being so amazing. And, and Doug Jones, the guy who plays Billy. He must be a master at life casts at this point, I would assume, the amount of characters he's played. Uh, yeah, you know. he's played a lot of characters, and he's been through the ringer. I mean, he's done more in makeup than, than anyone else I could even think of. Now, you did touch upon the fact, and I don't know if you can talk about this, so let me know, but you said you recently put Doug Jones back in that Billy Butcherson makeup. Well, I said I recently put Doug Jones into a makeup. Oh, well, I just said you put him back. <laughs> is that okay to say, or is that... Let's just put it this way. A lot of us have gotten together to do stuff for a, uh, a charity event organized by Bette Midler, but it's not just Hocus Pocus people. It's like Elvira and a whole bunch of iconic characters and, and actors, um, Meryl Streep. But it's a, it's a charity event. So we, um, we helped out. We actually shot some stuff at Alterian uh, for it uh, that my daughter Kira directed. Oh, awesome. That's so cool. She just went and shot the Elvira stuff too. You also did the Binks the cat work in this, yes. uh, in Hocus Pocus. You... Uh, you know, you, and I think you're known as the makeup guy, but how did you get into the electronic right. stuff? Because obviously these days, you know, you do Chucky as well for the child's play, uh, the current movies. And how did you get into that electronics world? Was Binks the first of that for you? It's funny. We'd always been doing sort of like minor animatronic stuff. Even when we did Darkman, we had an animatronic version of Liam's head um, as the Darkman character. So we'd, we'd always sort of like dabbled in it. And when this came along, they, besides let's take a zombie and chop him up, we, they said we have a cat that we want to throw through the air. We want to run over with a bus. Um, we want to deflate. We want to have him re-inflate. Re um, we need a stunt cat uh, to be thrown against a rock and posable cats and all this stuff. Oh, yeah, and then we also need a cat, actually, that talks and talks through the whole movie. CG didn't exist, really, at this point. Everything we did with Billy, including the moths out of his mouth, was practical. Yeah. Um, and we went into Hocus Pocus building a practical animatronic cat. We had a, we had a life-size one, and it was definitely the most complex thing that had been done at that point, we had some amazing mechanical designers on board. And a lot of that technology is still being used. Uh, the slave control systems for the arms and legs and stuff like that. I mean, we're, we're still using that in the child's play stuff. But um, it, was, it was a life-size cat that could do lip sync animation. And then they started experimenting with them and Hughes started experimenting with CG cat faces. and dumping at least like the muzzle of that onto the, to the animatronic cat or onto the real cat. So there's scenes in the movie where it's still the animatronic cat, like sitting on Max's chest and the camera's over him or its profile or whatever. And it's an animatronic puppet so that it can do specific things, but it's got a computer generated face on it. So it was the first time all this technology had come together and it was an interesting learning experience, I think, for all of us. But we had also built an oversized cat that a six foot two person fit inside with arm extensions so that you could go in close on the head for a close up scene and have the detail of the fur and everything look right in close up. Because if you're going to go in close up on a, something that's only three inches across, the fact that it's fake is going to be telegraphed immediately. But if that head is almost two feet across and you're filming it with a background blown out of focus, you'd buy it at whatever size it's supposed to be. So we were like, if we do it this big, same like we did with the dog for Honey, I Shrunk the Audience, oversize it, we can pack all this stuff into it and make it do all this really cool stuff. But it's, it's like, it was the size of E.T.'s head and E.T.'s head did amazing stuff. It's yeah. also the same size that Chris Wallace did the, the Mogwai heads for Gremlins. When he did the close-ups, there was an actual oversized close-up head. 
the problem with the large cat ceasing to exist was me agreeing to take it to the camera test for Billy Butcherson so that they could get a sense of how it looked and how to do the forced perspective because we'd been shooting video tests at our shop, you know, sort of like Lord of the Rings stuff where the guy in the cat suits really far away and the guy who's talking to him is really close to the camera. So it looks proportionate to the size of a real cat, but we didn't have the real ears yet. So we cut out some cardboard ears and stuck them on. And I still can vividly remember sitting in them, the screening of the footage from the makeup test and them loving Billy and having like two notes, one about his hair and one about his eye makeup. And that was it. We're like, oh, this is great. And then the cat stuff came up and they got all the stuff with the little cat and that we could make his tail do whatever. And, and it was all radio controlled. That was fine. They're like, okay, we, we know that works. And then we cut to the footage of the oversized cat and somebody in the back of the audience goes, that looks horrible. Those ears look like cardboard. <laughs> and I, I literally stood up in the theater and said, they are cardboard. It was just so you could get a silhouette of his head so that it didn't look like an oval. Um, and you could see it within the context of a, of a cat's silhouette. They're like, well, they need to be translucent. And I said, well, they will be, but we're not that far along in the manufacturing process yet. So we don't have those ears to show you. But in a couple of weeks, we'll have it all together. And there was this like minor panic that the oversized cat was, you know, not going to happen. Those decision makers have no vision. I'll tell you, it's mind it got blowing. The, it got the ax. So it disappeared. Oh, and the cat that we did, the life-size version of, of Binks, it was designed to do stuff that a real cat couldn't do where it had a wrist that turned and it could like gesture like a person could. So if it went back up on its hind legs, it could stop being a cat and it could like point and do things with a full shoulder joint and a wrist joint and a rotation in the, in the forearm that a real cat couldn't do. And we tested all that out and it creeped everybody out watching that in dailies. And they're like, just lock off all those joints so that it just moves the way a real cat can move and, and we'll be good. So it was a learning experience for all of us, but it was definitely a unique experience to be involved in. And then to have it come out and do like literally like zero business in the middle of summer, I think it was. Yeah, it was summer. Hey, you're laughing 20, what are we at? 27 years later now? 28. Yeah, yeah. Can't do it's the amazing math. what it's, what it's 27 years about. later. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, I have one other thing I want to ask you before I let you go. And I don't know if you want to talk about this. So you can assuredly just say no, thank you. But last week on the show, I did a whole episode about Scream, the horror franchise, and ah. Disney's relationship. Because at one point, you may not know this, you probably don't, but Disney yeah. owned Scream and was creating an attraction for Scream. I had no idea. It's crazy. That's amazing. Yeah, and the person I was talking with who is a huge Scream fan and has done some Scream documentaries and stuff, the story of Ghostface was brought up. And I was like, you know, I know a guy that got screwed over. And I didn't mention <laughs> a name, but I was like, he's, you know, let me see if he wants to tell this story. So do you have any interest in talking about Ghostface? Yeah, do you want to hear it? <laughs> yes. Yes, let's hear it. Okay. You're cool with this going out into the world. Oh, yes. completely. Yeah. Okay, great. All right. So we started a mask business, the Alterian Ghost Factory, um, back in, in the early 90s. And we did a line of Halloween masks that were sort of oversized latex masks, sort of in a very traditional vein. And then one of the guys who worked for me, Lauren Githens, had done this sort of fabric ghost face for himself and his wife for a Halloween party that they had been to. We were like, wouldn't it be cool to do that as like a vacuform piece that you could, you could just glue the sheet to so that the vacuform holds the shape of it? So we sculpted up like maybe six, I think, six different ghost faces. And one was based on the, the Scream character, you know, the long stretched out mouth. From the famous painting. The, right. And I think Van Gogh, right? Was it Vincent Van Gogh? 
No, Edward Munch. Edward Munch. Yeah. And um, he had done a, one of the, his Halloween masks had that same mouth. So when it was time to do the ghost faces, he did one that had that same mouth and a, a couple other variations on that. And we actually packaged them and sold them as a ghost maker kit where you could turn your tired old bed sheet into a Halloween decoration or a costume. And we sold a lot of them for years uh, before we got out of the mask business. And people would take the face and they would glue it on top of a sheet. And then they would like paint up the face and stuff like that and make decorations or do whatever. And they would hang them around their house and then send us, we asked if they'd send us pictures of how they used it as a decoration. And when we would go do all these mask conventions, we had this, you know, sort of photo album of examples on how people did like wall hangings or um, one person had made these figures on the roof of their house with them. And then a lot of other people just wore them as, you know, Halloween costumes. And then the movie Scream came out and we, years later, years and years later, and the killer had the same mask that Lauren sculpted. Like the same exact face. Literally the same thing. And somebody else had copyrighted it. Yeah, kind of. I don't know that the copyright is, there's a whole, there's a whole nother thing going on right now with some court case in Cleveland where that's all being debated separate from me and my whole thing on it. My whole response at the time was, oh, that's really flattering. How cool that our stuff got used in a movie. That's really neat. That'll probably never happen again. Hmm. Cut to today and they're going to make screen five and probably bring him back and all the decorations and, and everything else. But there was a copyright filed for years later by the company that puts them out. But they also at the same time don't claim ownership is my current understanding. I don't know all the ins and outs. But you couldn't sell them. You couldn't like currently sell them because you'd be sued by them. That's a really good question because there's, there's another company, I think it was the same company, ripped off two of our other designs, literally like exact, like a smiling face with a big single buck tooth in the top of the smile. I mean, I think they thought that we were like some little company that was gonna, we'd done this work and it had died off and we weren't doing it anymore. I don't think they realized we were a makeup effects studio and we would be around and we would watch all this stuff go down. But when Wes Craven was interviewed for uh, a Scream documentary, he even says we went into this house and there was a mask, a ghost face up on a wall. And we asked them where, they, where it came from and nobody knew. And we had to try and hunt down where this thing originated from because we wanted to use it in the movie. So I'm paraphrasing, but that's my, yeah. that's my understanding of it. And meanwhile, we're the ones saying, hey, make, you know, when you make a decoration, send us pictures. So we have like all these pictures of people doing exactly that same thing. Uh, and we still have them and we still have our brochures with all the ghost makers in it and the original artwork and the original card that goes into that went into the packaging with the the printer's color separation dates of 1991. Oddly enough, the guy that did our packaging artwork is Bill Boas, who went on to become a a great like sort of Tim Burton inspired production designer. Um, he did one of the Scooby-Doo movies. He's done all, all this stuff, but the ad art is literally a sheet rising up off a of bed with the ghost face on it. All of our business cards from that time have our logo, which was a triangle at the time, with the ghost flying through the triangle with the same screen face on it. So it's really ingrained in our promotional material all the way back to 1991. Tony, you need to look into the legality of some of that stuff and get <laughs> yourself some extra money because, I mean, that is, that's crazy. Well, anybody listening who wants to give me some legal advice, I'll make it worth your while. <laughs> yeah, well, Tony, thank you so much. These have been such amazing stories. I learned so much about you and I've known you for years, so this was incredible. But I think that means it's time for some trivia. Do you know the answer? Get your brain gears churning and play along. It's trivia time. All right, Tony, do you want to hit me with a trivia question first or shall I hit you? 
Uh, I will hit you first. Okay, let's hear it. What was the original name of the movie Alien, written by Dan O'Bannon? Oh, gosh. Extraterrestrial? I have no idea. No. What was it called? Star Beast. Can I tell you something? I've never seen Alien. <sighs> oh, my God. It, do I need to fix that? You do. I. You need to see that. and I'll, If you see that, I'll see Matinee. Deal. <laughs> Deal. I'm going to hold you to that. I like that. The Alien is the film that inspired me. Oh, really? The original? Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'll check it out. And you're going to check out Matinee and you're going to say, I loved it. I loved it. <laughs> Excellent. From you, I want to know, although the alien from the movie Alien didn't end up in the extraterrestrial alien encounter, where could you previously find that creature in the Disney parks? That alien did make it into an attraction. It did. It, it, it made it into an attraction at, at Epcot or, or Walt nope. Disney World. No, it was a studio tour. It was Disney MGM studio Studios. studio tour was Warner Brothers. I think it's Warner Brothers now. No, no, no. Disney MGM Studios is now Disney's MGM. Hollywood Studios. Okay. Yeah. Right. And uh, it yeah, made... and the alien comes out at you. And what attraction? It was like Hollywood Tour or something like that. The Great Movie Ride. Ah, I'm so close. <laughs> I still got a point. The studio tour was something different, but that's all right. Oh, well, you were in a car and you were driving through something. So. Yes. Tony, thank you so much for coming on the show. This was so much fun. And uh, thanks for sharing all your stories. Anytime. I'll, I'll, I'll spill the guts on some other stuff next time. Now, folks, if you didn't listen yet, be sure to check out last week's episode all about the unrealized Scream attraction that Disney was working on. And next week, it's the return of Primetime at the Parks, where we discuss one of my favorite sitcoms to ever visit a Disney park. This was a show that I never missed an episode. Hear all about it next week. The easiest way to make sure you don't miss any of the magic is by subscribing to Disney Coast to Coast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Wherever you search, don't forget, it's Disney with a Z, Coast to Coast. And folks, if you've been listening to the show for a long time but have never checked out patreon.com slash DisneyCTC, now is the time. See how you can become part of the DCTC community and earn rewards over at P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash D-I-Z-N-E-Y-C-T-C. Other than that, folks, have a magical day and an absolutely fantastic Halloween. Bye! Thanks for listening to Disney Coast to Coast! Have a magical day! <laughs> Disney Coast to Coast is produced and hosted by Jeff DePauly. Learn more about the podcast and become a supporter at DisneyCoastToCoast.com. This podcast is part of the DePodcast Network. Learn more about this show, plus find more quality and entertaining podcasts at DePodcastNetwork.com. That's D-E-Podcastnetwork.com.